on this computer. There we go. I am not a Laurel. I did produce my first scroll for the SCA in April of 2000. I've taken time off here and there to not scribe. So I won't say I've been a scribe for 20 years. That wouldn't really be the truth. But I'm guessing that 12 to 15 is about accurate. Uh, I'm not a Laurel. I just, I see Emmeline asking if I can, if they can get the Black Hours handout for my other class. Yes, you can. The handout for my other class is available on the Trimeris Royal University website. And you can also email me after this class. My email is on the handout for either of these classes. And I'll be happy to send you the link to that because it's on Google Drive and it will be saved there permanently. Um, if you put the link for this uh, class up in the chat right oh, now, yeah. um, I will repost it if new people come in. That is the link right there, not to Emmeline. I wanted to answer that to everyone. Let me fix that. Tech stuff, I swear. So that's the link, should be the link to the lettering guide class, which is the class that you're sitting in on right now. If you accidentally get the wrong thing, by all means, uh, message me or speak up in the class and I'll take care of that later. Um, lettering guide. I've not taught this class before, but I've been using a lettering guide for years. It's a wonderful thing. It's a sanity saver. It makes your work look much, much, much nicer. Um, if you don't have a lettering guide, you are slowing yourself down and potentially making your work look sloppy. A lettering guide is fantastic. They used a similar thing to mark uniform lines in period. They used pricking wheels or they used a ruler and stylus and they marked even lines so that their text would be evenly spaced. So if you're not marking lines on your scrolls, what you're doing is setting yourself up for lines that go this way or lines that go this way or lines that converge on each other and it can just be a royal royal mess we don't want that we want something pretty so we're going to use a lettering guide i'll get the handout out of the way if you're following along at home you optionally will need your calligraphy pen and some ink for about 10 seconds this is not a calligraphy class. You need this to mark and figure out how wide your lines should be and then you're done. Uh, paper you plan to mark. I'm using just a sheet of Bristol board. This one's nine by 12. Use whatever size you want. Uh, lettering guides work great on smooth surfaces like Bristol. They'll work on purg that has not yet been painted on. They're not great on vellum because the uneven wavy surface wreaks havoc on what the the lettering guide does you will need a ruler and a pencil and then the tool of the hour the lettering guide itself this this little godsend costs about four bucks from john neal like 350 or 450 it's in the four dollar range they're not expensive some other places have different brands uh, sometimes they're a light green instead of clear like this. I'm going to get my paper out of the way in the hopes that we can see it a little better. Yeah, that shows it up a little better. Yay. The lettering guide has all these holes in it, most of which you're going to ignore, which makes life easier. You've got a metric set of lines here. Ignore it. And then you've got three rows here in the middle. That, that middle, middle row, row comes down to the number 10 at the bottom. That is the only row you are ever going to need. As a scribe, trust me, that's the one you focus on. That's all you need. Along the bottom of this wheel, and the wheel is adjustable. It turns. It's wonderful. Along the bottom of the wheel is a series of numbers from 10 down to 2. At the very bottom of the main body of the guide, there is a little mark. You can line up your numbers with the mark. So that is nine. That's about eight. Back this way. This is 10. 10 is perpendicular to your straight edge. This is as wide as your lines can get. That's the largest setting possible. If you try to keep going, I mean, you can, 
what the lines are getting narrower again. So you may as well just go in one direction. I'm gonna set this aside for just a second. Before class started, before class started, I got my pen and my ink out. What you want to do with every nib is figure out how wide you want your lines to be. The best way to do that is to mark one, come on, two, three, four. And those four should be touching. They're not right now because I just went sideways rather than the way I usually do it. But that four is how wide your the main body of your letters is going to be. So like your M, N, X. This is usually referred to as your X height. Anything that goes above that, like the letter B is an ascender. H has an ascender. Anything that goes below that, like um, P's and Q's and Y's and G's, those are descenders. But what you need to know is your X height. It's also called your minimum height. So take 10 seconds and do that on a line. You let, you it, let dry. it dry. And then you bring your guide over here and you line up these dots and adjust it to and fro until you figure out the width between the bottom one and the top one. Now I did this before class started, so I happen to know that I'm going to want to set my gauge at number nine. Now period X height was usually anywhere between three and a half and up to five, maybe even five and a half uh, nib widths high. If you make them too big, your letters look all spidery. The thicks and thins aren't obviously different enough and it doesn't look right. If you make it shorter and smaller, you get bold, blocky letters, and those are aesthetically pleasing. I'm gonna rinse out my pen because I'm done with it. Like I said, you only needed that for a couple minutes. I'm gonna put my ink away before I spill it because I know me. And I'm gonna flip this paper back over. This is just scrap paper that I was using for another class. We were covering Lombardic capitals, yay. But back to my text block. Shove this out of the way. You've marked your framing margins all the way around your page. You've marked where your text is gonna go. This is actually the bottom of the page. I am left-handed. I do everything upside down. So ignore that if you're right-handed. But we're gonna line this text block. You take your ruler. I'm gonna zoom out just a bit. There we go. You set that bottom hole, the one with the number 10 above it, right on the very corner of your text block. And then you shove your ruler up under it. Brace your ruler, run this across. This is the precision part. Make sure the hole is on this exact corner. If it's not straight, you don't get straight lines. Or you do, but you get them at a slight angle and it's a pain in the butt. You want everything to be nice and parallel. So you double check, you run it across, back and forth on that line and make sure it's not going up or down at either end. You fidget with your ruler once or twice to get it the way you want it. And then you're just gonna use this middle row of holes here. Put your pencil in the second hole and go across. Put your pencil in the third hole and go across. And so on, all the way back and forth. Isn't this just the best thing ever? I feel like I'm one of those infomercial people selling you a kitchen gadget because it's just the neatest thing. Now you've only got 11 holes. That'll give you 10 spaces. Obviously, we have a lot more space here. So you slide your ruler up. This is your new guideline. You make sure your bottom hole is lined up with it. 
at both, at both sides. sides. Now I'm a little high over here, so I'm gonna come down. I'm gonna brace my ruler. I'm gonna go back and forth a couple times, make sure it's all lined up. I double check it with my pencil. And it looks good. So now off I go again, I'm off to the races. Now you can see why this wouldn't work as well on vellum. If the vellum is wavy, what usually happens is you get a bow, a bow in your paper, in your surface, and this comes up and slides off of your ruler. There's nothing more irritating than trucking along, making perfectly straight lines and having it suddenly do this. It pops up, it goes crooked, your line goes zoop, and you're like, ah, and you curse a lot and you throw things and it's just not fun for anybody. I actually now, have a ruler that has a, a groove in the back of it. Mm. So I can run my guide through that. Oh, nice. You can also have just a much thicker ruler. So you don't, you like if it's, this particular ruler is cheap. I got it during quarantine. I had to replace my entire scribes kit. Long story. Um, I needed a ruler and I just went to the grocery store and bought a $1.50 ruler. So this is not the best ruler in the world. You want a nice thick one because the thicker it is, the less likely it is for your guide to pop off of it. So let me go ahead and line that bottom hole up with the line. And the tweaking, if you look at my hand right now, I'm adjusting it in tiny, tiny increments. They may not even show up on camera. But once you get it, you brace the ruler, you double check it, and then you go again. And you just fill up your text block. There are a number of things that you can do with a lettering guide like this. Filling the text block is the obvious one. If you are doing a fancy scroll and maybe you have a side-by-side -side layout of two columns, two text blocks, you can make sure they line up. Let's say you've got a text block here and a text block here. Now these line up here. You get your ruler and you get your lettering guide and you go across and you just skip the middle and across and skip the middle and across and skip the middle until you get them lined up evenly and then they will match, which is a nice thing to have. You definitely want uh, everything to look nice and tidy and clean. Now, ordinarily, we're 15 minutes in and I've pretty much just demonstrated to you everything that you need to know about how to use the lettering guide, but there's more I'm gonna try and teach you anyway. Uh, does anybody have any questions before I move to this next stage? I have a question. By all means. Um, I'm assuming that each one of those um, on the tool is the mm -hmm. same width. Yes. Right? What if uh, your kingdom does different widths? Like we do four, six interchangeably. We do six for the wording and the A centers and B centers would do four. Oh, okay. Um, that's actually about what I'm gonna cover here. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> close, close. It depends on your kingdom standards. I'm from the mid-realm and it, we're sort of fast and loose. We do whatever we feel like doing. <laughs> um, it also depends on what alphabet you're using, what kind of spacing is more period. Great. So I'm going to get these out of the way. I'm actually going to get my uh, pen and ink back out. Question. You were talking yeah. about figuring out uh, what, you know, on the guide, like what number you needed to use. Could you show, I, w I couldn't really see, could you show how you figure out when you do your, your pen nib with how you figure out which number you are? Yes. So you have a pencil line and you work up from the bottom or down from the top. I, you, sh you should work up from the bottom, but like I said, I'm upside down. You measure your nib widths. You get your pencil and you set that bottom hole on that guideline and you check here and you go okay that's a little narrow and so you make it wider and you look at it and go ah oh, that's a little wide and so you bring it back and you just go back and forth until you find the right gauge yep. now for most of the nibs a little bit of uh product placement here I use Mitchell nibs from John Neal Booksellers. Mitchell is just a brand name. They're not any better or worse than any other out there. Uh, Brigantia is asking if I use a special calligraphy nib. No, I don't. 
This is more a question for the left-handed calligraphy class that I don't happen to be teaching right now. Um, but because I write upside down and because of my hand positioning, I don't use left-handed nibs. They were right-handed nibs are easier for me to find. So that's just what I have used ever since the beginning. Um, when I first learned calligraphy in the seventh or eighth grade, they didn't have left-handed nibs in my art class. We just had to make do. And so I learned to make do. Um, as it happens, the way that I write, I think a left-handed nib would throw off my game a little bit. Use what works for you. I am by no means saying that you should or should not do either one of those. But for me, the regular standard right-handed nibs, the straight cut nibs are what work best. So we're, we have our guideline here. We have our four heights, our four nib widths, I should say. And we just move the wheel back and forth until we get the number that makes us happy. Now, as I said, I'm using Mitchell nibs. This is a three and a half size. It's not the skinniest nib out there, but it's by no means the largest. I happen to know that an eight or nine uh, set on my gauge looks really good. I went ahead and set this at nine so that I wouldn't be confusing everybody. Uh, name brand I recommend. I've only ever used Mitchell's, so I can't really say that they're better or worse than any others. I will say that Speedball is sort of junk. Speedball C4s. Speedball are not great in my opinion, but uh, the people at John Neal can recommend you good stuff. Um, oh, the name brand I recommend for the actual guide, the lettering guide. This is called an Ames lettering guide because it's made in Ames, Iowa. It is sometimes also called the Alvin lettering guide because that's the brand name. Whether or not there are other brands, I genuinely do not know. You buy one of these and unless you lose it, it will be the only one you ever need. The only, the only problem I've found is that sometimes this, this gauge, the wheel, gets a little loose after several years and it slides around and won't hold the, 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 the setting that you put it on. You put it on the setting and if it stays nice and rigid, nice and stiff, then you're set. You're good to go. Uh, you are using a two and a half Mitchell nib. The lines are pretty far apart, so do I skip holes? The answer is yes. There's nothing wrong with that. You use the setting that you that is going to work best to give you those three or four nib widths to make it look nice. And I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate what looks nice. I'm going to come back to my text block. Um, when you take this and you've got it marked out all the way, start with the second line, not the first line. Start with the second line here and put a little dot on it. Because what we're measuring is top, middle, and bottom of our letters. Top, middle, bottom, top, middle, bottom, top, middle, bottom. And this is just every third line. And you can do this all the way down your scroll for most alphabets. Carolingian looks great with this. Most petards look really good with this. Uh, early period insular minuscule looks great with this. Your lines are gonna be sp spaced far enough apart that people can read them easily and you're not gonna have ascenders and descenders from different lines crashing into each other. Now, if you are doing uncial, which doesn't have much in the way of ascenders or descenders, or if you're using black letter, the, the texture quadrata, the picket fence style Gothic black letter writing, you can get away with this line, skip, this line, skip, this line, skip, this line, skip, and just do every other line and you can pack your text closer together. So if you're looking for economy of space, choosing the right alphabet can help you help do that. You. Now I'm gonna go ahead and get my pen back in the ink. And again, left-handed, this is my stupid party trick. I write upside down. I'm 
we're just going to go to the letter G because I want to get all the way to a letter that has a D center and then I'm going to call it good. Could you zoom that in before you get there? There, I'm at G and let me zoom in now. Zoom in, come on. I'm being fussy. Why is it out of focus? I know, I had that problem too. My camera is out of focus, and I don't know if it's just um, if battery giving me trouble or what. Is it at least? You may need to tap it. Better now. Is it better now? Okay, good. I that you're freezing mm -hmm. on my screen. Yeah, yeah I'm noticing so that. It's out of focus. It's uh, low bandwidth issues, so it's pixely. I am not pleased because I've never had this happen in a class before. I'm going to yell at my phone and it's not going to do any good. We're going to take a second and see if it gets cleared up. It's not clearing up. I will cuss a couple times. There's nothing I can do about it when it does this. Um, <laughs> we'll wait a couple seconds for the bandwidth to improve. If you have um, other people in your house and they're currently like streaming Netflix or something, that could be affecting it. I am, I am home. Oh, oh. The gods just don't like me. <laughs> um, Ron Voldis says, I write upside down. Yeah, you know, this is another left-handed thing. It's not really relevant to this class, but I, when I was first starting out, I wrote right side up. And I was, and I was learning, learning alphabets. alphabets. I spent about four months practicing right side up. And I was I'm having a hard time getting serifs and strokes to line, to line up with up each, each other. other. And somebody said, do the strokes reverse. It was actually in Drogon. It said, if you're left-handed, do the strokes from bottom to top. And I did that and it helped a little, but I was still, was my, still hand my hand was in the, way. in the way. So I couldn't see to match the serifs up to the strokes. And I thought, well, if I'm already doing the strokes reversed, what if I do the, the whole letter reverse? So I took my practice book, I turned it upside down, and I did one alphabet, and I flipped it right side up, and it looked better than four months of right side up practice. So I have never given up. I've never looked back. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about it being the right side of the brain and left side of the brain. That's some of it, but I've done this so often that it's no longer... Um, a paper issue or a brain issue. These are letters and I just read them. So to me, this is, this is just how I write now. That is so irritating. I wish that I could get better bandwidth right now. I don't know what's happening. There we go. Is that better for everybody? A little bit? It's still blurry, but it's not freezing. Hey, come on, focus. It's not going to focus. Yeah, it's better. Okay. It's starting to clear up a little bit. I've never had that happen. I'm very sorry, everybody. Um, let me see. Set the letter and guide to the correct width. Use your alphabet, brace it. Uh, mark each line. That's how you fill in your text block. Next page of the handout. Mark every third line. Um, Carolingian secre secretary actually works a little farther apart because they have such tall ascenders and descenders, you can get away with like having two above and one below. So for example, a really fancy H. So I've got two lines of ascender and then my X height and one line of descender. Um, you know, stuff like that. You can play around with it. Unseal. You're going to want every other line. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, I was mentioning textura quadrata. Let's do. Here's your A. The ascenders and descenders for this are so short that they're not going to crash into each other. So when I come down here and do my D, there's still plenty of space here in this empty line, if you can see that. Um, e, F. Um, oh, I see what Lisha is saying in chat, right? Yeah, it's you're right. It's 
I've had people insist that it was a left brain, right brain thing because you're drawing the letters. And to me, I'm not drawing them, I'm writing them. But it is helpful for getting a feel for if a letter's a little bit wonky. You draw it upside down and you look at it right side up and you can immediately see if you've made any errors. It's, it's helpful for that. But mostly it's just the way the strokes work. This is a pulled stroke for me. And this is a pulled stroke for me. So this is my top left corner. Now for a right-handed person, can I even hold the pen with my right hand? This is a pulled stroke. So this is your top left corner. But yeah, I've been doing this, oh my goodness. I have a friend who is a graphic designer and I was in her office one day looking at one of her catalogs and I was staring at the front cover for five minutes trying to figure out what was off about it before I realized that one of the words was written upside down. They were trying to be all trendy and cute and I was just reading the page completely normally without even, my brain wasn't even switching back and forth between right side up and upside down. It was just, I'm reading the page. And I could not figure out what was messed up about the page for five solid minutes. It was very bizarre. So let me see, what else? We have every third line. We have every second line. We have, let's do two up and one down. Uh, let me see, secretary, the, the late Italian hand. You can do two up and two down. So for example, here's your H. a little too tardy, I'm sorry. So the word hello. And it looks like I'm freezing again. Ah, this is so irritating. But I'm almost done, and we did have good bandwidth for the part that I wanted you to see. So, I mean, that's always nice. There are two other things that I want to cover in this class which are other uses for your lettering guide. Suggestion for your bandwidth is if you don't need your computer, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you disconnect your computer and then turn on your audio and then you're only doing one uh, video feed or just turn off your, turn off your video feed on your, uh, second, oh, your yeah. laptop one. Let me try that, see if that helps at all. And if it doesn't, know. turn it off entirely and just turn on your audio on your phone. Well, the audio on my phone is so terrible that I've actually had to re-record classes before because you just can't hear it. It's, it's, I'm really sorry. But I don't really need camera to show you what else I want to do here. I'm going to rotate my page. Hopefully that'll show. And I'm going to just do this in stop motion. One of the obvious, the obvious thing that you use your lettering guide for is filling your text block. But if you're illuminating, you can use your lettering guide to make a second set of lines perpendicular. And then you get a whole grid of squares and now you have a diaper background for your illumination that is perfectly even. That is a wonderful, wonderful thing to do if you're doing especially very genius. small diapering. Sorry, what's that? I would say that would be genius. Diapering is a pain to get those lines straight. I was doing a scroll, I had to stop uh, back in January, um, that had extremely elaborate diapering. For those of you who don't know, a diapering is usually a checkerboard or diamond patterned background to an illustration. Very popular in certain time periods, especially around the 1300s. And this one, the diapering had big squares, medium squares, and little squares that all fit inside each other. It was fantastic. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But I needed really, really, really tiny squares to get it all to line up and get it to work. So I used my lettering guide to mark my grid. Um, yeah, you, you do your first row from top to bottom and then you turn your paper sideways and you do it again from left to right or right to left and you get a perfect grid. If you want diamonds, turn your page to a 45 degree angle, set your ruler so you get a guideline from, angle, you know, from corner to corner of whatever it is that you want to illustrate 
you know, measure three inches this way, three inches this way, if it's not a perfect square. And then use that as your guideline to fill in in both directions. And then you get diagonal lines and you have a diamond shaped grid pattern. It's wonderful. The other thing that you can do, I used to have a problem with my illuminated borders crashing into my text. If you make a little window frame around your text block and use that as the boundary for your illustrated border, it won't crash into your text block. And the way you do that is you finish your text block and then you take your ruler and you set the bottom hole on the edge of your text block and you just go all the way around it, one hole up. And you just make a little window frame all the way around and then you're done. And that's it. I, we, I have I'm one in. more thing. To, I have yes. one more thing to add. Mm -hmm. um, if you do a lot of illumination on Pergaminata or on things that you can see through, if you take your Ames lettering guide and run it with pencil and then go over it with black pen, you can actually use that on your light board to be able to not have to ever draw outlines ever again. Ah, uh, yes, very true. I personally don't own a light board, so I always forget about the tracing aspect. Tracing, I used to be a snob about, but tracing is entirely period, absolutely period. If they had light boards, they would have worshipped at the altar of the light board gods. They definitely would have used them. We know for a fact that they held them up to windows or whatever. They absolutely traced their work, especially in later period when books were being mass produced. You wanted to be able to create these quickly. You didn't create original art every time. You had templates and models that you copied and you traced them. You absolutely can create a permanent text block and then trace over it or set it under your translucent ground like Perg or Vellum and write on it. And then you don't have to worry about marking it in the first place. That's definitely a useful thing. Yeah, thank you for adding that because that's not something I thought of because I keep forgetting that other people use light boards. It's a thing. But yeah, I, actually, um, I was given I was given the light board and it was it's it's amazing now. <laughs> so. I still do things like uh, graphite transfer paper, which is the non waxy carbon paper basically. Actual carbon paper will ruin your work because it's waxy, it'll resist paint. But the graphite transfer paper works exactly the same way. Um, but yeah, we're at a half hour in and this, I was afraid this was only going to be a five minute class. So I'm actually glad I made it to 30. Does anybody have any questions? Do they have anything they would like me to attempt to show you? Should I put my other camera on and hold it up to my laptop camera so you can see it better? Is there anything I can do? I'd Chat love window to see you do, the, do a little bit of the diapering. Just a, little a little bit of the diapering? All right, all right. Let me get my handout out of the way. I'm going to turn my page sideways. I'm going to ignore the fact that it's inked all up. You just use the exact same setting because you want squares, not rectangles. You go to the edge, the sideways edge of your block. You put that bottom hole on the edge of your block. We'll check it and then you just work your way up back and forth behold squares teeny tiny squares mm -hmm. and there you go and it looks gorgeous yeah the um, the particular manuscript that I'm looking at I'm working with even smaller squares because the largest ones are six units wide. One, two, three, four, five, six, there we go. So that is a big square. And those have animal faces in them like lion heads. And then they'll be next to three by three squares, which have a small diaper pattern in them. And then the next one will be a big animal head. And the next one after that will be a three by three. But then when you go sideways, 
they subdivide it again into two by two by two. And they pattern that in red, red, blue, red, blue. So I have a grid of four, a single, or a grid of nine, and it's all in one illumination. It is a fantastic manuscript. It's the Roman de Alexandra, Bodleian Manuscript number 264, and the illustrations will blow your brain right out of the water. Just incredible. Let me see. Um, does everybody have the handout? If you don't have the handout, the link is available on the Trimeris Roy uh, Royal University website. It will also be available permanently on my personal Google Drive. The moderator just posted the link again to the chat if you need it. Excuse me. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Using a lettering guide takes like five minutes, but it saves so much time and makes your work so much better looking. I really could not imagine doing scrolls um, without it. Could I repeat the name of the manuscript I mentioned? Yes, it is the Bodleian Library in this, uh, B-O-D-L-E-I-A-N, Bodleian Library, manuscript 264. Is and I have it memorized because I looked at it a lot. Say again? What was that, Ania? Is there a link for the Bodleian Library? Is there a um, link? There's a website for the Bodleian Library, and you can look up digitized manuscripts. It's not part of this class, so it's not in the handout. I, it's a complete tangent is what it is. I just happen to really like that manuscript. This guy wants me to do his knighting scroll. He was knighted 20 years ago and never got a scroll for it, and he wants it to be something special. And this is his favorite manuscript, so I've been working from it. And that was the first time I was ever introduced to this manuscript, and it is just mind-bogglingly beautiful. If you do diapering at all, prepare to be intimidated, because they did, I mean, they did some fantastic work. Um, is there anything else? I'm showing we have 17 people in this class. Holy cow, how did I get 17 people to look at a lettering guide? 15, because two are you. <laughs> oh, two of them are me, two of them are me, so only 15, I'm sorry. I'm used to getting five people in my classes, so I'm still just thrilled. I mean, I have one and I have never known how to use it, so this class has been like genius. And now I feel silly because I didn't know how to use it, and I'm like, it's so simple, how did I not know? Well, you look yeah, at the I thing, it's an architect's tool. It's a drafting tool and people look at it and it's full of a million different holes and like how the heck and where do I start and the instructions that come with it don't make any sense because yeah, I talk about yeah. all the different rows of holes. So no, I'm happy to offer this class. If anybody has questions or wants to revisit it or if they missed something, if they came in late, I would be happy to do a one-on-one -on -one chat. You know, not as part of today's university, but at any point, I'm on Facebook, um, I'm in the scribal groups in SCA Scribes and also SCA Scribes and Illumination and also Known World Aspiring Scribes Forum, which is a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, the manuscript number, everyone's asking about that manuscript. This is hilarious. I'm teaching lettering guide and everyone wants to know about it. Well, I have to say I'm rather disappointed with this class. Uh, Why is that? Because I am not a scribe, I'm mm -hmm. here because I'm the moderator, mm -hmm. and I'm in the process of selling off all my crap because I'm moving two provinces away, and now I'm like, ooh, I should go buy more stuff and do this <laughs> thing that I've never done before, and you're horrible and mean for making me do this. I regret nothing. Right? <laughs> you regret nothing. I will face God and walk backward into hell. I don't care. <laughs> Evelyn's here. She can she can totally attest. As I've said straight out, is is my full skill set is what can I set on fire? And I'm here going, ooh ooh, let's paper, let's play with paper. So let's see how long till I set that on fire. <laughs> I understand. Now I'm going to I, and I've my been face by... because I'm done. I'm also going to stop recording.